Happy Easter, everyone. I read to you from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. and 
believe. They still did not understand the scripture which said that he must rise from death. Then the disciples went back home. Mary stood crying outside the tomb. While she was crying, she bent over and looked in the tomb and saw two angels there dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. Woman, why are you crying? they asked her. She answered, they have taken my Lord away and I do not know where they have put him. Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who is it that you are looking for? She thought he was the gardener, so she said to him, If you took him away, sir, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around towards him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, this means teacher. Do not hold on to me, Jesus told her, because I have not yet gone back up to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am returning to him who is my father and their father, my God and their God. So Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and related to them what he had told her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Come together and pray. Let us pray. God of life, God who conquers death, we come before your throne today asking for that spirit of life to be in us too. For us to view your scriptures, your words, your actions in a way that is pleasing to you. So on this Easter day, Lord, a day where we celebrate your resurrection, 
silence and our silly voice with your own. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our living Lord, our Redeemer, our friend. Amen. It is Easter, and that means we must read from the Gospel of John. John chapter 20 that talks about the ways in which Jesus' disciples find him and he is reunited with his people. The passage begins by telling us it's early in the morning. It's still dark. People are uncertain. Not many people go out in the darkness. And yet we find the very faithful Mary who goes to the temple to anoint her friend's body. But when she arrives, she is shocked to see that the stone has been rolled away and her mind jumps to a very logical but a very terrible conclusion. Grave robbers have been here and they have taken the body of her friend. We don't know if she even looks inside of the cave. We don't know if she looks to see where the linens are in the tomb. But what we do know is in her fright, she runs to get help from Jesus' other disciples. When she goes to them, she tells them, they have taken the Lord. We don't know where they've put him. They engage now in a time of searching. Where is their friend? Where is this Messiah? Where is the man that they call the Son of God and the Son of Man? And these are people who are very much in a dark place in their lives. They are filled with sadness. They are filled with fear. They are filled with surprise in what's happening. And so these two disciples go running. One of them is named as Simon Peter. And the other is unnamed or called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And many people think that the disciple whom Jesus loved is John. Or it could be that we are meant to understand ourselves as the one whom Jesus loved. What we do know is these two disciples get involved in a bit of a silly running race as they go darting off and trying to outrun each other on route to this tomb. And it's good to note that Peter is the same Peter who denied Jesus. Peter, in a sense, is a failed disciple, an unfaithful disciple. And the one who is the beloved is the one who we are told waited at the foot of the cross with Jesus through his suffering. And yet these are the two that are chosen together to go to the tomb to find this Messiah. So they go and they remind us of God drawing us into that family, whether we are sinners or saints, whether we are considered failures or successes, God draws us in with love and with forgiveness. And those sins are emptied from us just like the two. Now, the beloved outruns Peter, but then there's an exciting ending because he doesn't go in, but Peter is the one that actually goes into the tomb first. And when he does so, he sees all the linens wrapped up with the body parts separate from where the head was. And we are told that he believed, but we don't know what he believed. All we know is that the tomb is empty for sure, and they go back home. Then comes Mary once more in this final arc of the story. And there are so many references back both to the beginning of this Gospel of John when he talks about in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. We are back to a new beginning in this passage. Mary stays crying and when she finally goes into the tomb for the first time, it's not empty, but there are two angels. Now, usually in scripture, when an angel appears, people are terrified and they have to tell people, don't be afraid. But Mary is in such a state that she either doesn't recognize that it's angels or she is so overcome that she is just going to do whatever it is, even tackle these 
divine beings to get back, to take back his body and ensure that it has the dignity it deserves. And they ask her, maybe what's a, a bit of a silly question, you know, why are you weeping? Who, who are you looking for? But she turns away and as she goes outside, she encounters a third. And she thinks it's a serpent. She thinks it's a gardener. And this gardener asked her, same question. Why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? These are the first words that we find Jesus speaks in this Gospel of John. When he speaks to John the Baptist and asks, what are you looking for? He asks Mary. And Mary is seeing this gardener just cries out again, you know, if you've taken him, let me know. I will take him. I don't care if you can't carry the body. I don't know what is going to happen. All I know is that I am grieving and I will do anything to get back this person whom I love so much. And this gardener then reveals himself by saying her name, Mary, Maria. He, we don't know the tone of voice that he uses, if it's said with love and care, if it's said with a sense of sharpness, if it's said with his particular tone of voice, because we know how teachers speak, we know the tone that it comes across as, because Mary responds rather than teacher. She recognizes that voice, she recognizes that tone, she recognizes exactly what her name means coming from this individual. Haradonai is here. And when you think about the same passage of John where Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. And here we have exactly that. Mary hears his voice and she knows exactly who it is. Now, there is a bit of confusion that happens afterwards. We don't know if Mary touches him we don't know if Mary grabs him or holds on to him because we could imagine her excitement in seeing her friend and wanting to probably hug him up. But Jesus tells her, no, don't hold on to me. You can't cling to me. I still have to go to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. And it is a reminder that as much as we may want to just cling to Jesus as much as we might just want to stay in our sanctuaries on an Easter morning and experience the glory and the joy and the celebration of this resurrection, we are asked and called to go back out into the world. And Mary is given a task, go and tell my brothers what has happened. But he ensures that she is included in that. In, her use, in his use of my father and your father, my God and your God, you are like my sibling now and I care for you and I'm going to take you along. And as I was reading it, I was actually thinking about my own home and all of the times I would bring somebody home who I would try to warn my parents in advance, but I would be the person that always brought home a friend or always brought home a stray, or always brought home someone who was struggling and needed a space to talk or needed a meal. I am the one that does that in our house. My um, parents are probably not too pleased about it all the time. But they made this space a very welcoming one. And so I could hear myself saying, yeah, I'm going to this house. It's also your house. Come along. It's a place where you will be safe. It's a place where you will be fed. It's a place where you can enjoy just living this life that you have been blessed with. But then you have to go back out into the world. You can't stay here. And I ask you today that you consider what that might look like in your life as well. If you bring people home, or if it's not very safe to do so, or if there is a place that we can do that and claim the rest of our siblings in Christ all around the world and recognize how bonded we are together. That we can say, yes, my God and your God, my father and your father, you are my brother, you are my sister. And so we end this together. The passage ends 
with Mary taking up a role as the apostle to the apostles. She is the one that's sent. That's the difference between a disciple and an apostle. The apostle is sent. And she now goes to evangelize, to share the good news, to spread the message of Jesus' resurrection. And she announces, she doesn't question, she doesn't waffle about it, she announces with great joy, with great certainty, I have seen the Lord. And the word that's used here for see is the equivalent of to know, or to believe in, or to receive, or to trust the Lord. So she's not just saying, well, I've glimpsed him out of the corner of my eye, no. See him, I know him, I receive him, I, I believe this is who he is, and I trust in what I have experienced, and now I'm sharing it with you. And that is the power that she shows at the end of this passage. Friends, on this Easter Sunday, let this be a passage that we celebrate, but let it also be a passage where we recognize that we too are human. And so just like Mary and the disciples, we go through our periods of sadness and despair, our periods of darkness and uncertainty. But we seek out the light. Or we help those who are in the darkness, we seek them out as well. And when we are caught up in that darkness, now seeking the light, let us be open to what Christ is showing us as new life. Let us be open to ways in which this God that is coming to say, well, the old life is gone. Spring is here. I'm going to grow new plants. This is going to be like Eden is restored and it is new. There is new life. There is new creation. There is a new world here with this God that Jesus. And if we get to that place of being able to truly say out with the old and let the new life, new creation come into being, then I know that we will be able to go out with the confidence of Mary and say, I have seen the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever.
we bow for our benediction. Let us pray. All praise to God and our Father, the Lord of Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy, the God of all consolation. Teach us, O Lord, not to rely on ourselves alone, but to put our trust in you. For the God who can raise the dead to life again will also deliver you. And now may the blessings of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, rest, remain, and abide with you all and all of God's creation everywhere, both now and forever.